All right. So I will go ahead and uh, introduce myself. My name is Martha Burtis. I am the Associate Director and Learning and Teaching Developer here in the Open Learning and Teaching Collaborative at Plymouth State University. Um, and I, that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> Let's go around the room. Let's go around the room here in person and then we'll go on Zoom. You want to go ahead, Rob? Okay, I am Robin DeRosa and I am the Director of the Open Learning and Teaching Collaborative here at Plymouth State and I am sitting awkwardly right next to Martha, but also Emma on Zoom here. Um, and next to me, but she stepped away from the table for a second, is Hannah Hounsel, who uh, does advising here with us in the co-lab as well. And with that, I'll turn it over to Amy. Hi, Amy Pascal, assistant professor and HHC. My name is uh, Erica Redberg Hall. I'm a, an educational technologist here for USMH, the whole system, and I also am a teaching lecturer. Both I teach talks in the computer science department currently, and I've taught in the communications department as well. So let's go ahead online and I'll just call people's names because of course nobody is knows who the, where they are in relationship to anyone else's Zoom. So Rissa, you wanna start us? Sure, my name is Clarissa sorensen Andrew. I'm in sunny Albuquerque, New Mexico. I teach at Central New Mexico Community College and I teach uh, chemistry and statistics and I'm a, I'm a PhD candidate in my spare time. Mm -hmm. um, Nick, you want to go next? Uh, sure. Uh, I'm Nick Helms. I'm uh, at PSU. I teach uh, literature and uh, disability studies. And uh, Robert? Uh, sure. My name is Rob Morgan. I, excuse me, I teach at Washington University in St. Louis, not the one in Seattle. Uh, <laughs> and I'm um, a teaching professor in uh, drama in design and run an interdisciplinary program called Beyond Boundaries. Thank you for joining. Um, Becky. Hi, I'm Becky Noel. I teach at PSU. I teach history and I wear a couple of um, sometimes very heavy and sometimes not so heavy administrative hats. That's a good way of putting it. <laughs> um, and hopefully you guys can all see the slides that I have up. Give me a thumbs up if you're able to see those slides. Yeah, great. So I'm going to do a little bit of a presentation here. I will also preface this by saying that um, this presentation um, actually came about this past summer when I was teaching a track at Digital Pedagogy Lab on social justice in the curriculum. And we were doing a fair amount of talking about something, a, to a topic that I think more and more people have been focusing on during COVID, which is designing for care um, and thinking about caring for our students in our the design of our courses, as well as in our pedagogy generally. Um, and I, one night when I was sort of like, Thank you. One night when I was just sort of um, considering this topic, I realized that um, uh, self-care is also um, a part of care. And I, I began to imagine like, what would it be like if we talked and, and centered self-care a little bit more in the work that we do? And we talked about that a little bit more intentionally. And I also want to um, just share an anecdote, which is that the very first time I ever heard the term self-care was in therapy, when a therapist asked me about my self-care. I was not in a great shape. It was after the birth of my first child, and, and she asked me about my own self-care, and my response was, well, I, I try and take a shower every day, and um, I th I've shared that anecdote with other people since then, and I think a lot of people have um, have sort of laughed and also um, indicated that they had, they had similar reaction the first time they heard about self-care. Like, we're like, well, I, <laughs> I brush my teeth. Isn't that self-care? Um, and, and obviously, uh, you know, attention to this topic of self-care has sort of expanded since then. That was many, many years ago. Um, and now there's, a, I think, a greater attention to what that term actually means. But with that has come some baggage. And so self-care sometimes gets shared now as hashtag self-care on Instagram when people are like putting up pictures of like the avocado toast they made for themselves. I'm going to pick on avocado toast. Um, just like as though that's self-care. And so, I mean, it is kind of important, I think, to acknowledge those two ends of the continuum that we are not talking about basic hygiene, but we are also not just talking about like some of the stuff that gets wrapped up in self-care, I, I think in social media, when we, we make the term less than what it, what it really could stand for. And what I'm really focusing on is what that means for us in the classroom and as laborers within academia, what self-care looks like. 
So um, this um, is a quote pre-COVID that I've always both like wanted both wanted to make me weep and also giggle at the same time. This was from an article in Inside Higher Ed almost um, you know seven years ago where they did a big study to find out what exactly do professors do all day. And the tagline on this article was research shows professors work long hours and spend much of day in meetings. Um, as though this was a really revelatory um, finding of this study, but it actually was sort of a big deal when this study came out because it was like the first time anybody had like formally acknowledged that guess what? faculty labor and there's real work involved in this and that when you count up those hours and you count up that labor it's more than a lot of people who are sitting outside of that um that position may, may acknowledge or understand um and this uh, this is more kind of pre-pandemic this is um during the kind of dismantling of higher ed that was going on in the state of wisconsin um in the mid-teens um, where Scott Walker just said, well, he really thought that this $300 million in cuts wasn't going to be too hard for the universities because faculty can just teach one more class a semester. And what's the big deal about that? Um, and then um, we have similarly um, attention that's, you know, pre the crisis that we're in right now, attention that was beginning to be paid to this kind of labor and this kind of work that falls on the backs of particularly minority faculty, faculty member, members of color, but also female faculty who tend to field a disproportionate amount of um, requests and inquiries and support needs from students who align with them. Um, it's kind of invisible work that happens. It's often emotional labor that is difficult to measure. Um, and faculty really were struggling with um, what with this term, we sometimes call it cultural taxation. Um, this this labor taxation that um, gets put on the backs of people who already are dealing with so much. Um, so then we're um, kind of just moving towards where we are right now. Um, and within um, this moment with COVID unfurling around us, um, we've all read the headlines about um, the number of people within academia who are feeling like it's time for them to leave just because um, they've been under such a heavy burden for the last, and, and to acknowledge like this is happening across all kinds of um, areas of labor and work, but I'm fo you know, focusing specifically on higher ed more than ever before, faculty talking about changing careers, retiring early, um, people feeling not only overworked, but undervalued at the same time, as well as scared and frightened and living through a pandemic. Um, and one more final quote um, to kind of set the stage. Uh, this was a piece in the New York Times, um, no, in the Chronicle, sorry, um, from last year, where they were talking to professors about how they were dealing with the, the pivot and the move to um, remote online learning and then, and then hybrid and high flex learning. And I, this was a, such a poignant quote for me, this faculty member, um, I can't remember what school she was at, who's basically said, well, I just thought all I needed to do was get up earlier. So to me, it just brings us back to where we started, which is that the reality is that this is not a problem we can solve by simply adding one more course to people's load or getting up a little bit earlier or attending more meetings. The reality is that what's being asked of us is more than we can bear. And what we have to do then is figure out how do we decide if, if we're going to continue to operate within the system, how are we going to do that in well in ways that preserve ourselves? Um, and I and I will also just say by way of one more caveat that I struggled so much when I was putting together this original presentation because the last thing I want to do is promote a mindset that's sort of a neoliberal mindset that's like, oh, here's how you can continue to. <laughs> Um, work within a system that is not valuing you and overworking you, and you can make it work because nothing about this, nothing about the equation balances. There's no way to really write that. But that doesn't mean that I think we can't be more intentional in talking about what it means to care for ourselves and what that looks like in our classrooms, not only for ourselves, but for our students as well, because the reality is I think a lot of the things I'm going to be talking about once we, we in 
we pay attention to them for ourselves. They, they potentially benefit our students. And there's also this whole idea of like modeling um, self-care and why it's important for us to show others in our lives that caring for yourself is something they should be doing for themselves as well. Um, when you look around at the literature of self-care, there's lots of different definitions that you can draw from. And some of them I don't really like for some of the reasons I talked to at the beginning, which is that they tend to be a little bit surface level in terms of thinking about what that means. But I really liked this one, which was um, from this article, what does self-care actually mean? Um, self-care is really anything that we deliberately do. So it's again about this intentionality with our own well-being in mind. It means giving ourselves the same grace, compassion, and care that we give to others. And one of the reasons why I really like this quote is that that idea of grace, compassion, and care, I think is something that was really emphasized and continued to resonate starting in spring 20 when we talk about our students. Um, many of us are, were lucky to work at institutions where at least the line was, we need to extend grace and compassion and care to our students and how can we do that? And many of us, because that matters to us, worked very hard to think about how we would do that intentionally for our students in the change of classes in, in spring of 20, but then also in the design of courses going into last year and this year as well. Um, so what I'm suggesting is that we substitute in this, um, in this sentence, uh, not giving, giving our, ourselves the same grace, compassion, and care that we give others, but the same grace, compassion, and care that you give to your students. How do you give that to yourself when you're thinking about your teaching? So how can we center care, not just for ourselves, students, but for ourselves in the design of courses and curriculum? And this is where we really have to start. And I throw this up here without, like, I want to acknowledge there's nothing simple about doing less. And I'm going to talk about all the different ways that I've thought about what doing less could mean. Um, but for me, the, the way or where this has to start is with three, these three questions. And I'm sort of focusing on a course for this, but you know, you can rewrite these questions more broadly if you wanted to, to a whole curriculum or to your entire mindset of pedagogy. But thinking about a course, what is the purpose of a course? And that's not the learning objectives of the course. What I'm really asking us to do is step back from those sort of institutional structures that we use to define and articulate what a course is and ask ourselves as educators for each of the things that we teach, what is the purpose of what we are doing here? What is our hope for our students? And what does this course mean for that hope, right? Like, what is it that we hope students take forward with them into the world from this course? Um, and what do we believe students or what do we hope students will remember about this course or this experience, this learning experience a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now? Um, and I will say that when I bring this up, and even when I think about this in relation to my own teaching, this is a really difficult question. Um, and one of the reasons why it's difficult and some of the questions that I'll continue to ask are difficult is that it really asks us to maybe call into question some of our assumptions and beliefs about the work that we do and about what matters in our classrooms. It means questioning some of what we have brought forward with us from our own experience as students. Um, it means questioning maybe what our schools and institutions are telling us about what ed education is and why courses matter. Um, but really putting that stuff on the table and examining it much more closely. And another way of thinking about this, because do less can just feel so like, right, okay, I'm just going to do less, Martha, um, is maybe thinking about this more about if, if you cannot do less, can you at least do more of what you love? Can you at least do more of what it, you enjoy and what re-energizes you in your teaching as opposed to, and jettison those things in your teaching that exhaust you, de-energize you, and make you feel like you would like to quit your time. Um, so this is where I'm going to start with this idea of rethinking content. And we talk about, you know, this comes up a lot in our in our work here in the in the collab and in the work that we do with faculty, which is the what is the purpose of content and coverage. Um, and I want to acknowledge that there's all kinds of disciplinary complexities to this, um, which are, tr are real and true, and we need to, uh, again, examine those and talk about those. But I think for everybody taking a moment and intentionally thinking about what is the purpose of co content coverage in a, in a 
a, an individual course, what would just as a thought experiment, a course look like with the least amount of content you can imagine? Like, what would that mean for you, for your students and for their experience in the class? And this last one, which I like to acknowledge, which is um, we had uh, Dave Cormier here last um, winter talking about this in particular. Are you teaching content that's abundant um, more and more with the, you know, the growth of the internet? Our relationship with intellectual content has changed as have our students. So if you are teaching content that is abundantly available elsewhere, does that mean that you can decenter that content in some ways or the ways that you teach that content traditionally in your classes? And in doing so, does that breathe a little bit more space into your courses? And that phrase, breathing space, is what I keep coming back to as I think about these practices. How do we breathe space into our course schedules, into our syllabus, into our idea of content to make room for ourselves and our students so that we don't always feel like it's more than we can handle. It's more than we can get through. And the last thing I'll just say about content is as tricky as this conversation can be and as difficult as it can be to unpack, we all know the reality that when a semester starts, we have a vision of what we're going to cover. And like 95% of the time, we don't ever get to do that in a semester because life happens, all kinds of things happen, weather happens, illness happens. You go down a tangent because students get interested in a particular thing, something in the world happens that's related to your class and you have to switch things up. People get stuck on a project and it takes longer than it was supposed to and you have to build a little bit more space. So the reality is that we already do this. We already adjust. We just don't do it intentionally necessarily. We do it um, in response to a problem or a situation or an opportunity. What if we try to build that into the fore, the fore end, the beginning of our course design process instead of waiting and just packing everything in there and then let's see what happens. This second one is about class time and thinking about class time differently. And some of what I'm saying here is really about taking the practices that we sort of engaged in because COVID required us to do and asking ourselves, what about those practices actually do we wanna take forward with us? And this is one I think that might be one of those. Many of us had to rethink class time. Um, during the pivot to remote, but also as we had to rethink maybe teaching in hybrid and high flex contexts, class time didn't mean the same thing as it had meant before. Um, so what else can we use class time for? Can class time be used for work, for student work? So that instead of assigning work for students that becomes more labor for them, but also more labor for you because then you're responding to their questions and confusion outside of class. Can that work happen in class where you can address those issues collaboratively and collectively together, where you can be present and watching that work happen? Um, or maybe what you need to do is take time, if really moving further along the self-care spectrum to like using class time for something completely different, going for a walk together with students, Ask, coming together and telling stories together that relate to what you're learning and talking about. Things that don't require a really heavy lift on your part necessarily in terms of preparation, assessment, um, again, uh, answering a lot of confusion or questions from students, but that just makes space in the class for a community to emerge. It's still work, but it's a different kind of work than what we often think of class time meeting to be. Yeah. So just to clarify a question yeah. from Krista, um, how does this relate back specifically to self-care? Like this idea of knowledge abundance and rethinking your content and using class differently. Like what is, how does that? So I would say yeah. two things. The first is going back again to this idea of breathing space into the class, right? So that so often I think what overwhelms us and what becomes more than we can imagine is that we just have more than we can get to in a particular semester that we've scheduled for and prepared for and designed for more or it requires us to be um, using class time in really, um, the word I'm looking for is, um, 
predetermined and critical way. Like if we if we don't use time for this, we're not gonna be able to get to the next thing. And if we don't get to the next thing, we won't be able to go beyond. So part of it is about like loosening the joints there and that's kind of chiropractic um, and allowing a little bit more space to emerge for just conversation and community. And again, the second piece I would say is this is not to say going back to self-care because what I'm trying to think about in terms of self-care is how do we do less labor that feels difficult and hard and overwhelming. Maybe that's just doing less, but sometimes it's just about doing more of what we love and enjoy and that we find reinvigorating. So if, for it, and this won't be the case for everybody, but if for you, loosening that space in the class so that you can take time for conversation, for community building, for going on a walk together to get to know each other outside of the confines of a room, if that's something that for you feels reinvigorating, feels re-energizing, feels a lot more like self-care than what you're traditionally doing in your classrooms, is that potentially a practice that you would want to embrace and bring into, um, into your design? I see your next question, Carissa, about, uh, Arissa, about um, self-care and pedagogies of care. I think they absolutely overlap. I think it's and that's what I was saying at the beginning is that I feel like once we start to do these things for us, we actually end up doing things for our students. And very often, if we are intentional about how we do things for students, we can wrap them up with doing things that are self-care for us as well. But at the same time, many of us know that pivoting in March of 20 and suddenly becoming incredibly flexible and doing so much care for students did not feel like less work, right? So that's where for me, this comes back to kind of intentionality, right? Thinking really intentionally about how do I care for my students, do the work that I want to happen in this course, but do it in a way that feels joyful and reinvigorating for me, as opposed to how we so often feel by the end of the semester, which is, I didn't get done what I wanted to do. I'm exhausted. I'm overwhelmed. Um, and I feel um, like empty. <laughs> and you know, I need I need to be re-energized, which is how often we think of our breaks as that opportunity to do that. Um, and some of these next ones may seem even a little bit more um, clear on this front. So this is a big one, looking at the policies in our courses. Um, and ditching those that create more work for us, particularly if we don't, A, we don't know that they actually create benefit for our students or promote learning or actively could harm our students. So again, this is sort of related to a lot of what many of us were thinking about during um, our, our moves during, in our pedagogy during the pandemic where we did sort of look more critically at policies Again, this is about doing it intentionally, not in just the context of a crisis, but looking at our syllabi, are there, are there policies that we, um, that we currently include that we haven't really went back and looked at through a critical lens for a while, that when we really consider them, they don't necessarily benefit our students, they make more work for us. Um, are they things that we can consider changing or releasing ourselves from? Um, and we can talk about what some of those are during the Q&A. This is a controversial one, but it's one I kind of like to put out there, which is canceling class. Um, because the reality is that the world won't end if we cancel class. Um, I am married to somebody who taught um, you know, science in a community college for 15 years. And I know, I will say that a lot of this presentation has been informed by my conversations with him because this question of canceling class would come up again and again in our conversations and it would be impossible for him. He literally couldn't wrap his head around it. Even when he was feeling under the weather, he didn't want to cancel class. When we had things going on in our family that were overwhelming, he didn't want to cancel class. I don't know if canceling class is always the best thing. I don't think we should do it all the time. But I do think asking ourselves, why do we 
I'm going to use the word fetishize. Like, why do we fetishize seat time, class time to such an extent that we allow ourselves to never even consider cancellation when it's something that we need for our own mental health and our own self-care? This um, is making me think about how um, in the so when the pandemic first hit, I remember feeling a little bit like every day was a snow day. So even though I was working and even though I was being productive, I had a sense of like, oh, things sort of slowed down and I could take a breath and I would sometimes take a walk with my dog and, you know, all sorts of things that felt a little healthier, even as the pandemic was scary. But now I feel like not only have snow days been taken away for children, but what we've really done is taken the sort of snow day feel and replaced it with the remote work feel, yeah. which is basically, you know, we're always on. Yeah, you're always, always yeah. on. It's and so I just feel like um like we're unlearning yes. some of what we learned at the beginning about flexibility and grace. And we're starting to say, oh, we can take these very strenuous and difficult circumstances. Um, and actually shunt them aside and do what we've always done, which is, you know, being crazy, being overworked, being yep. whatever. And in some ways it will even be worse because we've taken away a lot of boundaries um, and we've got a lot more pressures on us institutionally because of budgets and whatever. So I, I just feel like there's, there's been some parts where COVID was sort of a healthy way of rethinking our patterns and then institutions moved in to try to co-opt all of those yes. things we were learning yep. and find ways to make them back into over a culture of overwork and now seems like the time to resist that you know to say wait like and before I, we and it, and and what you're saying makes me think of and also in response to something that Rissa just said in the chat that I think what we also have to do is there are some things that are institutionally bound, institutionally mandated, things we cannot easily push against, which makes it all the more important for us to identify those places where we do have agency and we can make choices. And if that means saying every semester, I'm gonna give myself permission to cancel two classes, either because I need it or I feel my students need it, then I'm gonna do that. That's gonna be an intentional act on my part. And it's gonna be an act not of like opting out of work, not of laziness, but of self-care, naming it as self-care, not as those other negative things that so often it gets identified as. Um, I was gonna say something else about that and it went out of my head. Uh, it'll come back. Um, this is another one and this also like, this is also a place where the connection may seem a little bit amorphous, but again, this is about using class time for things that perhaps are more restorative for us and our students than what we traditionally think of class time, but also that tend to be really beneficial to our pedagogy and to our students themselves, which is talking, you know, replacing labor intensive class prep with the idea that you're going to spend a class session talking about pedagogy, talking about your teaching, why you teach, how you teach, the choices that you make as a pedagogue. Our students rarely get to see into that. And in my experience, when I open that fourth wall, so to speak, of the classroom into my brain, into why I'm doing things, it's incredibly rich. It helps build community in the class. It helps students understand more deeply the work that we're doing together. It is, I mean, they can be incredibly restorative conversations and it doesn't take a lot of labor from me. What it really just takes is for me to be willing to be a little bit vulnerable in class and talking about my choices and having open conversations with my students about them. Another one that is a similarly, I think really restorative practice is having a class time where you talk to students about their own learning experiences. I have never learned more about teaching than listening to students tell me some of their rather tragic stories actually of past learning experiences. It sheds so much light um, for me on what they are dealing with individually, like what baggage they individually are bringing to the classroom and how I can be more mindful of that in my own teaching. And again, how is this a self-care practice? Because you're potentially replacing something that feels really labor intensive and draining with a more restorative opportunity to use class time. Oh, and I thought of the other thing I was gonna say about canceling class. 
So canceling class doesn't have to just mean, okay, it's a free day. We'll all just go do whatever we want. You can be intentional too about what you ask students to do with canceled class. I would not say during your canceled class time, make sure you sit and work on your paper because that sort of defeats the whole purpose of, of trying to build restoration into this, but maybe asking everybody to choose one act of self-care for themselves and, and you do this up yourself that you then share with each other when you come back together. So that you're actually building this mindset of caring for our, each other and ourselves into the into the teaching and learning experience as well. Um, this is another one um, that related to like bringing those conversations about teaching and learning into the classroom. I find really beneficial, which is reconsidering the labor of design. Um, so we tend to think all of this labor always has to fall on our shoulders. When the truth, the reality is that if we can breathe a little bit space into our classrooms and we can make time for it, there's no way what reason why we cannot bring students into these conversations and have them work with us, have part of the work of the class be co-designing the class. Um, this is another practice that I've done a lot in my own teaching and it's not always um, like, where you land is not always where we, you would have landed if you had done it, but that doesn't make it bad or worse. In fact, what it usually means is it makes it much richer in terms of your students' engagement with the class and the, and, and the work of the class because they have been a part of it. They have been a part of designing it and thinking, thinking it through. Um, yeah, this is making me, we're having some conversations in the chat also yeah. about like precarity and you know, yeah. even just something as simple as canceling class. I know when I used to be an assistant chair, one of the things I was supposed to kind of look at were like, if the teaching lectures are canceling class too often, like that would, you know, that would count against you. Whereas with a tenure track person, that wouldn't even be a question on the table for the most part, right? You're really studying and, uh, and we talked about this with Hannah with staff needing to like punch in and out basically on a time clock, it's more or less what we have at Plymouth State now. So if that's sort of counting for your seat time, becomes more and more important, the more precarious you yes. are. But so we're talking about, okay, so obviously we know we need like administration and the culture of the institution, not just the individual faculty member to figure out how to yeah. do this. So one thing, so we're talking about like, how do you, how do you do that? And how would you get, you know, that culture to happen? And I'm thinking, well, one thing that it seems like it's like, if students are actually going to have agency, one thing that a lot of us, I know a lot of you guys online, because I know you, um, a lot of us work on is like, well, you have to design for student agency. You can't just walk into your classroom and be like, I hope you're all agents of your own education now, right? You have to actually set that up in very yeah. intentional ways. I feel like institutions have to do the same thing if they want their faculty to feel empowered, creative, innovative, whatever, they need to set the parameters the same way we set them in course design when we're talking about the kinds of students you want. But I think one thing we don't really ask the administrators very often is what kind of a faculty member do you want? Right. And how do you design for, a, for yes. a setting that does that? We do it all the time in teaching. What kind yep. of student do I want? How do I have to design for it? Institutions should ask that more often. I'm a little afraid that they'd say, oh, we want compliant faculty members who don't make waves, you know, like maybe that's but it, authentically it. But. but I think that, but I think those questions are so important because they, we all operate under assumptions about what the answer to that is without talking about it. Right. And the reality is that I suspect what you actually would hear if you talk to administrators is a lot of conflict conflicting ideas. Mm -hmm. And once you have those conflicts of ideas, then we can have a conversation about what that conflict means. Well, right. you want compliance, but you also want faculty who are creative and innovative and um, creating space for student agency. So can we have a conversation about how those two things cannot coexist? Um, I would, and I also frankly would rather know what those things are than operate under assumptions that may or may not be correct. Um, Okay, so I'm almost done here with these ideas and then we're gonna open this up a little bit more conversation. This is um, maybe kind of an obvious one, but another one that I think requires intentionality, but can go a long way, which is like finding places to build coalition and collaboration. So even outside of formal co-teaching, which can be really hard to make happen, 
Um, are there places where you have classes with colleagues that overlap where you could exchange your labor, right? So if you're preparing an uh, activity or a discussion or a presentation of a particular topic and it's related to something your colleague teaches, could you teach their class for a day and they come in and teach your class for a day? So that you are, you're, you're distributing that labor a little bit across, um, across different courses and across different experiences um, and relying on each other a little bit more for that kind of self-care. This is a huge one and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it because we do whole workshops about this, but this is so often at the heart of this. It's like, I can't even emphasize this enough is that rethinking assessment um, and grading so much of how we feel about our teaching is wrapped up in how we feel about grading and assessment. So much of um, the ways in which we get de-energized is wrapped up in grading and assessment. And so I encourage anybody who is not already exploring alternative assessment um, practices to do so if they feel like that's something that they're interested in because um, as somebody who went from doing traditional grading to doing um, ungrading in my classes, it completely changed my relationship with how I thought about teaching. It made teaching feel much more energizing and um, restorative than it ever had before because suddenly this, um, this sort of burden that I associated with the work was lifted. And that isn't to say that ungrading doesn't require any labor, it does, but it's a completely different kind of work. And again, it's the kind of work that I get joy from as opposed to the kind of work that exhausts me. Um, the other thing I would say about this is that I often feel in conversations with faculty about grades, something that's, gets, that's, not, that's sort of unspoken, is that we sometimes think grading is like the penance we pay for getting to be teachers. And that's a weird thing to say because we're, you know, I started this presentation about talk by talking about how like so many people feel overwhelmed by this work, but the reality is most of us got into it because we feel so strongly about the mission of teaching and the mission of education. And there's this weird sense that, well, grading is how I, is the difficult labor I have to do in order to demonstrate that, you know, that's the, that's the labor that shows I care, right? When the reality is that research shows that grading does all kinds of harm in the classroom in, in so many situations and that our students don't benefit from traditional grading practices. Um, so giving yourself permission to question those practices and to build for yourself an approach to assessment that's authentically in line with your values and that does not feel like it is constantly a burden you bear or something that de-energizes you, I think is really, really important. Um, and um, finally, this whole idea of saying no, I was joking with a faculty member this summer that I thought we should run a workshop in the collab just called How to Say No, just because I was hearing from so many people that they felt like every day there was another ask and they didn't know how to say no. The reality is that's not an easy thing and I don't mean to be flippant and creating a slide that says just say no. Um, but I do again think we have to, in order to care for ourselves, we have to um, intentionally consider what's the worst thing that can happen if we say no to something and what's the best thing that it could be for us if we were to say no to something and give ourselves permission to do that. And then I'll just leave us with this quote from Audre Lorde, caring for myself is not self-indulgence, it is self-preservation and that is an act of political warfare. Um, and that's the end of the formal part of this. I'm going to stop recording if I can find the button.